It's the bomb. Welcome to Nuclear Hot Seat, the weekly international news magazine keeping you up to date on all things anti-nuclear. My name is Libby Halady. I'm the producer and host, as well as a survivor of the nuclear accident at Three Mile Island from just one mile away. So I know what can happen when those nuclear so-called experts get it wrong. This week, we again take a close-up look at the work of Dr. Ian Fairley. He published an article in 2014 that correlated more than 60 studies about health risks to small children living within five kilometers, three miles, of nuclear reactors. Important information that needs to be deployed by us in any battle against nuclear reactors. That interview with Dr. Fairley, plus our ever-popular Numbnuts of the Week, activist shout-outs, the Daily Show Twitter campaign, and more nuclear information than PBS is including in the new Ken Burns documentary series on cancer. All of it coming up in just a few moments. Today is Tuesday, April 7th, 2015, and here is the week's anti-nuclear news. In a continuation of last week's report on the situation at Fukushima Daiichi, NHK interviewed Naohiro Masuda, president of TEPCO's Fukushima Daiichi decommissioning company, who said, We have no idea about the debris. We don't know its shape or strength. We have to remove it remotely from 30 meters above, but we don't have that kind of technology. It simply doesn't exist. We still don't know whether it's possible to fill the reactor containers with water. We've found some cracks and holes in the three damaged container vessels, but we don't know if we found them all. If it turns out there are other holes, we might have to look for some other way to remove the debris. NHK then asked about the government's target to begin by 2020. And like the rest of this interview, Masuda's response was surprisingly candid. He said, it's a very big challenge. Honestly speaking, I cannot say it's possible. In an interview with the Times of London, the chief of the Fukushima nuclear power station revealed that recent scans of one reactor revealed the worst possible result. All the nuclear fuel that was in the reactor's furnace had melted and dripped down into the concrete outer containment vessel. Japanese nuclear officials are now saying that the eventual solution at Fukushima will be something like the Chernobyl solution, a sarcophagus of some kind sealing the three facilities. However, unlike Chernobyl, it would have to extend underground to stop contaminated groundwater reaching the sea. Nuclear Hot Seat would like to point out that a sarcophagus solution was suggested by Arne Gunderson of Fairwinds Energy Education three years ago, but of course was ignored. Completely ignoring the ongoing crisis situation at Fukushima Daiichi, on Tuesday, April 7th, Japan's ruling party urged the government to push for a return to nuclear power. But it seems Prime Minister Shinzo Abe Baby's Liberal Democratic Party is the only faction to be interested in restarting the nukes. All of Japan's reactors are currently offline as utilities strive to meet tougher safety standards imposed after Fukushima Daiichi, the worst nuclear disaster ever. Opinion polls regularly show most Japanese people want to phase out nuclear power, and Abe's coalition partner, Komeito, also wants atomic energy gradually phased out. According to Asahi, some LDP members are also opposed to its return. Residents of a town near the Fukushima Daiichi nuclear power plant can now stay in their homes 24 hours a day in preparation for the lifting of the evacuation order. On Monday, April 6th, the central government began to allow evacuees from Naraha town in Fukushima prefecture to stay in their homes at night as well as the day, as if that makes any difference in radiation exposure. This measure will remain in effect for three months. All of about 7,500 residents have been living away from their homes since the 2011 start of the nuclear disaster. Many residents are voicing concerns about radiation, and officials say that only 182 of about 2,700 households in Naraha have applied for permission to stay. 
the fact that they are willing to stay in an area known to be radioactive at dangerous levels shows the effectiveness of the propaganda coming down on them from the Japanese government. Meanwhile, in a completely opposite action, hundreds of residents of Minami Soma in Fukushima Prefecture plan to sue the central government of Japan for lifting evacuation advisories near the crippled Fukushima nuclear plant, saying the decision endangered their lives because radiation levels remained high around their homes. 535 plaintiffs from 133 households in the city just north of the nuclear facility wreckage will demand that the government retract its decision to lift the advisories and pay 100,000 yen, or $837, in compensation to each plaintiff. During the decontamination process for areas around the plant, the government initially wanted to lower annual radiation exposure doses to one millisievert. But after that goal proved impossible, the target became 20 millisieverts. Hey, 120. What big difference is that? Kenji Fukuda, an attorney representing the plaintiff, said, The government has selfishly raised the limit on annual public radiation exposure. This is an illegal act that violates the resident's right to a healthy environment, guaranteed by the Constitution and international human rights laws. The government's law on special measures concerning nuclear emergency preparedness states that its purpose is to, quote, protect the lives, bodies, and properties of citizens from a nuclear disaster, end quote. Good luck enforcing it. And now, nuclear hot seat, nuclear hot seat, nuclear hot seat, none that's out of week. The government of Japan is planning to use Expo Milan 2015 in Italy to play up the safety of Japanese food products, including those from Fukushima Prefecture. This, according to official representative Tatsuya Kato. That's right, keep pushing the Fukushima food is really safe to eat propaganda because you got to feed all of those Olympic tourists in 2020. And what better way to convince them to chow down on the local goodies than to start convincing them now, five years ahead of time. Mm -mm -mm. In a recent interview, Cato said, I want to use the Expo as an opportunity to correct any wrong perceptions or information, an obvious reference to the import curbs imposed by sane countries on Japanese food after the Fukushima nuclear crisis began in March of 2011. Cato, showing great outrage, said some countries still require Japanese exporters to submit reports on radiation checks or certificates of origin before accepting food products. The nerve. That's why poor little Japan has been forced to hide its origin of products behind false labels, as recently took place in Taiwan, or hopefully behind the no labeling of country of origin at all that's mandated by the Trans-Pacific Partnership Agreement. No word if Cato stamped his foot as he said, the government should assist efforts for the lifting of such restrictions, then revealed plans to brief key figures visiting the Japanese pavilion at Expo Milan 2015 on how disaster areas have recovered and what measures have been implemented to ensure food safety. Really, dude, the only food safety from Fukushima is, don't eat it! It's evil! Now, Expo Milan 2015 will be held in Milan, Italy, no surprise there, from May 1st to October 31st, and the Japan Day reception will take place sometime in July. It is expected to attract several hundred guests. And Cato says it will be an important opportunity to underscore the safety of Japan's food. Officials will hold a briefing and distribute leaflets at the reception. Ah, to be an Italian anti-nuclear activist this July. And that's why you, official food representative of the Japanese government, Tatsuya Keita, is this week's Nuclear Hot Seed, none that's out of week. To North America, where for the first time scientists at the Woods Hole Oceanographic Institute in Massachusetts have admitted that a water sample collected in mid-February from Vancouver Island in British Columbia contained trace amounts of cesium-134 and cesium-137 
isotopes that are a marker for Fukushima. This makes it sound like it's the first exposure in North America to radiation from the Japanese nuclear disaster. But in truth, a plume of radiation from the explosion of Unit 3, as well as the other releases from the facility, went airborne and hit the northern part of North America's west coast in a plume starting eight days after the disaster began. Radioactive kelp and radioactive bluefin tuna were also found off the coast of Southern California less than a year and a half after the disaster began. And last November, the Woods Hole team found Fukushima radioactivity in a sample taken about 150 kilometers or 93 miles offshore in Northern California. So while this story of finding radiation off the coast of Vancouver Island is important and significant, it also points to Woods Hole's ongoing amnesia about how many times radiation has been found off the coast. Meanwhile, Fairwinds Energy Education and Arnie Gunderson have a new video out about the hot particles that were scattered all over Japan and North America's west coast in the aftermath of Fukushima Daiichi. Hot particles being tiny radioactive particles of debris. We will link to that video on our website, nuclearhotseat.com, under this episode, number 198. What's been labeled by the Nuclear Regulatory Commission as a small fire at the Limerick Nuclear Generating Station in Pottstown, Pennsylvania, was severe enough to generate an NRC label of alert, which is the second highest of a four-level alert system used by that agency. The GE Boiling Water Reactor, the same design as was at Fukushima Daiichi, sustained damage to the safety system that handles high-pressure coolant injection that is used to inject water in the event the reactor ever needs to be shut down while the pressure is still too high. A third of the reactor's fuel will need to be replaced. Limerick Nuclear Generating Station is within 50 miles of Philadelphia and 8 million people. Last Saturday, April 4th, thousands of visitors converged on the Trinity test site in New Mexico, where the first nuclear bomb was detonated nearly 70 years ago. Many of them posed for pictures near an obelisk, marking the exact location where the bomb went off. Tourists in the vehicle caravan out to the site were greeted by demonstrators from the Tularosa Basin downwinders who came to protest the 70th anniversary tour. The Downwinders is a grassroots group that is set out to bring public awareness about the negative impact of the detonation of the bomb. One local resident, Rosemary Cordova, explained that she's lost 18 members of her immediate family to various forms of cancer over the years. Yet the government has done nothing to compensate New Mexico families through the Radiation Exposure Compensation Act legislation that has been aiding families in other states near other nuclear test sites for more than a decade. Cordova said, We have done more to assist the people in Japan after the bombs in Hiroshima and Nagasaki than we've done to take care of the people right here in the United States. Seventy years later, you would think it was time. In the U.K., legislation rushed through in the final hours of Parliament allow for local planning laws to be bypassed so nuclear waste dumps can be forced on local communities. Local councils and communities can still object to details of developments, but cannot stop the plans altogether. The move has alarmed local objectors and anti-nuclear campaigners. Since the Royal Commission on Environmental Pollution found in 1976 that it was morally wrong, their phrase, to keep generating nuclear waste without a demonstrably safe way of storing that waste, there have been at least four attempts in Britain to find the right site, all of them shelved after strong protests. And they kept generating the waste. Objectors now worry that ministers are desperate to find a solution to the current radioactive waste problem in order to win public support to build a new generation of nuclear power stations. And in France, anomalies have been identified in the composition of the steel in certain parts of the reactor vessel at Flamanville, 231 miles from Paris and just off the English Channel. According to the French nuclear regulator, ASN, these test results revealed the presence of a zone in which there was a high carbon concentration, leading to lower-than-expected mechanical toughness values. But what could go wrong? This is Nuclear.
Don't ask. We'll have our featured interview in just a moment, but first, a reminder that Nuclear Hot Seat needs your donations to help keep us going and growing. This is a steady thing every month, whether there is travel on my agenda or not. So please, if you can, go to NuclearHotSeat.com, scroll down on the home page, click on the big red Donate button, and know that whatever you can do to help me meet the monthly fees that I have to pay to keep this program going, every penny of it, every pence of it, every whatever your particular small monetary unit of it is greatly appreciated. This week, we revisit an interview done with Dr. Ian Fairley last August in Nuclear Hot Seat number 162. Dr. Fairley is an independent consultant on radiation risks and a former scientific secretary to the UK government's committee examining radiation risks from internal emitters. He joined us via Skype from France, where he was vacationing, to discuss his paper. Please note that at one point, Skype becomes more Skypeish than usual, and there is an echo on the line. I've edited it out as best I can, so if you bear with it, it eventually ends, and you'll be able to get all the information. Ian Fairley, welcome to Nuclear Hot Seat. It's my pleasure to be here. Let's start out with giving people an idea of your background. My main degree is in radiation biology. In other words, um, the effects of radiation on cells and tissues. Before that, I was a chemist at the University of Western Ontario in Canada. My postgraduate studies were in how best to deal with radioactive waste. And that was at Imperial College here in London. After that, I entered the civil service and uh, worked for the Department of Environment and the UK government for about 10 years, I suppose. And after that, I retired. But during my previous, uh, shall we say, life, before I started studying radiation biology, I actually worked for Greenpeace Canada as um, an advisor, a science advisor to them on their various campaigns. So you could say I've had a fairly rounded set of experience in, in terms of both an academic and a civil servant and also a Greenpeace campaigner. It seems that scientists like to consider themselves outside of politics, at least when they are putting forward the information that they do. Do you consider yourself anti-nuclear as a political stance? Yes. Basically what it is is that uh, a long time ago I became fairly certain that the increased leukemia that we see in the near nuclear power station came from their discharges. And I thought that it was unconscionable, just totally wrong for kitty winkers, little kids, to be dying from leukemia because of us generating electricity. There's lots of other ways of generating electricity. And I suppose it's fair to say that I'm, I'm not really very much in favor of nuclear power. But having said that, I'm also a scientist. And for scientists, the most important thing is to stick close to the evidence. In other words, if the evidence points in a certain direction, then check the evidence. Make sure it's the best evidence. And if that means you have to change your views, so be it. But with childhood leukemias, it's always led me to be more and more sure that uh, my initial premise was right. Um, so for that reason, I'm quite happy about being and sticking close to the evidence because that evidence really does show that there are increased leukemias near nuclear reactors. To be clear, you did not do a study on the childhood leukemias showing up around nuclear power plants, but you did compile existing studies and existing statistics. How extensive were those, and what led you to take this particular approach? Well, to actually carry out an epidemiological study takes a lot of time and a lot of money, and you have to have access to a lot of data. And oftentimes that data, data is proprietary, and you can't get it yourself. You have to rely on other people getting it and giving it to you. 
on the other hand, there were over 60 studies worldwide on this particular issue of childhood leukemias near nuclear power plants. And that in itself provided uh, enough data for me to do my work properly. Um, 60 studies is a lot of studies, and there was a lot of data in those studies. And so that was by far the best thing to do, was to mine the existing data rather than actually uh, carrying out a study from de novo, so to speak, using new data. Explain to us the extent of the danger that you discovered in doing this compilation of existing research. By the way, I should say that I, I collaborated in a lot of this with a, a German scientist called Dr. Alfred Kerblein, and he will crop up a lot of, in my work. What we found when we were doing this work together was, first of all, the large number of studies. I mean, 60 studies worldwide. In toxicology, this is probably one of the biggest areas that's ever been studied. For example, if you were to look at asbestos or chemicals or lead poisoning or anything like that, there's nowhere near 60 studies on health effects from particular plants. So this, this is a very large number. The second thing is that we could do what are called meta-analysis. In other words, what you do is you, by careful examination of the data, you can add the data together. You've got to be sure that you're adding oranges to oranges and not apples and oranges, but you can do it. And when we've done that, you can get meta-analysis. Other people have done the same, by the way, and they all come up with the same answer, and that is that there are increased leukemias near you know, power stations. It's beyond, the thing is, it's beyond doubt. There's a very clear pattern of raised childhood leukemias near the power station. There was one aspect in the article that you did cite where you combined the statistics, apparently mm-hmm. oranges to oranges, for Germany, Great Britain, Switzerland, and France into a single table. I was struck by the fact that what you came up with was 37% increase in childhood leukemias within five kilometers, which is about three miles, from almost all nuclear power plants in these countries. That's right. Why had no one thought to compile these statistics before, and how alarming is this to you as a result that came from this? Well... The first thing is that the four governments, the scientists in those governments obviously knew that this was going on and they obviously knew that each of the four countries were doing this. Um, It's an obvious step for the data and the four studies to be added together and I'm absolutely positive that the scientists, the relevant scientists in the four countries did it. In fact, we know them and we know they did it, but they didn't publish the data. We did, and uh, Dr. Corbyn and I, we did it together, and very statistically significant uh, increases in childhood leukemias near all the reactors in those four countries. Not, not quite all the reactors. In France, there was only about uh, two-thirds of the reactors, but pretty well all of the reactors in the four countries. What conclusions can be drawn, or did you draw, from the compilation that you put together? Well, it was quite clear that there was an increase. It was beyond the bounds of chance. This wasn't a fluke finding. This meant that it was clear that there were increases near NPPs and that we had to move on to the reasons for that and the energy policy consideration. When did you start this? The actual study itself was commissioned by the organizers of a conference in the UK in 2012. And myself and many other contributors uh, to the conference, that all their proceedings, all the proceedings of the conference were going to be published in a journal. The problem was that my article or my talk was very controversial. It resulted in a lot of delay in the peer review process. And as a result of that, the, the proceedings of the conference delayed by about two years. I understand that there was one scientist who shall remain nameless who challenged you repeatedly and extensively. Would you talk about what 
that was like for you and also how you responded to the various challenges that you received? The person concerned that I have known for many years is a, a worthy adversary, shall we say. I have a lot of respect for his work, Palina. Um, he's a good scientist, but we have different views about nuclear power. And it was a real tussle, shall we say. A long, drawn-out gladiatorial battle. But it was on the basis of science, and we argued the toss about scientific evidence. And that took a long time, over many pages of paper, and many, many points. The editor of the journal, he was very good. He had to be a neutral referee in this, but he, he was well informed. He knew about the issues, and he knew what to allow, what not to allow. And so my congratulations go to him. A lot of other people would have ducked out on this. And he saw it right through. And in the end, he published it. And his reward is that as a result of the publication, it was in about two or three months, and about 500 people downloaded it, which in this, shall I say, narrow subject area, is a lot of downloads. It's... Um, that's gone viral, or partly viral. A good chunk of the readership of the Journal of Environmental Radioactivity must have downloaded the, the, the article. And for the editor, that is very heartening, because that means he struck a chord, and people are picking up on what he's published. So he was very happy indeed. There is one other thing I should mention, and that is that I, I waited for about three months after the publication before I went on to the web and with my own blog on this. And that is to give time to readers to point out any errors or omissions or bits for a better wall or whatever may be in the article. And to date, touch wood, there haven't been any at all. So that's given me a lot of confidence in the sense that even although I can imagine a lot of readers will be find this difficult to take, they haven't come up with anything which has sunk me below the waterline, so to speak. A shell hasn't landed below the waterline or anything like that. In fact, there haven't been any shells. So it's, uh, I'm quite pleased with that, and I'm relatively confident um, with the hypothesis now. It seems that the extensive challenges that you went through with your worthy scientific opponent helped you vet the article to the point where nobody could pick anything apart with it. How accurate would that be? <laughs> that would be very true. Yes, you're right. The fact that the, the peer review process was so tough and so prolonged basically meant that the article itself was pretty watertight. Now that we have this watertight article that correlates raised leukemia rates in children with proximity to nuclear power plants, what impact has what you've written had on public awareness in the media and on governmental policy? Well, it's really hard to say. Uh, what I do know is that amongst my colleagues and friends here in the UK and in Germany, They've more or less taken this on board, and it's now accepted, certainly in the environmental community, that this is a serious matter that has to be taken on board. And uh, building nuclear power stations really is very problematic now. As far as governments are concerned, now they deny it all the way. It's very difficult for them if they've decided that they're going down the nuclear line to find this evidence which directly contradicts it. Well, they, they reject the evidence, unfortunately. What do you think is going to happen here in the United States as more and more people become aware of this article and have the opportunity to read it? That's a good question. In the United States, the, right now, the National Research Council is about to embark on a big study of childhood cancers near U.S. reactors. And this is going to be quite important. There's about 100 reactors in the United States, and if you get data for all those 100, that's going to be a fairly powerful study. Now, what this study that I've uh, produced says is that in the rest of the world, the evidence is crystal clear. 
there are increased leukemias near nuclear plant. So I'm pretty sure that government scientists in the United States will have read the article. Indeed, given that the fact that there's been so many downloads, and my the consultant that looks after my, my website says, oh, uh, I could chunk of those, like uh, half are from the United States. That means that the scientists who can in the United States may know about the study, for sure. So that, say, 200, 300 scientists in the United States have downloaded this and have read it, they must be aware uh, in government circles of this article, and it must figure somehow or other in their thinking. I'm not sure whether they will like the article in the sense that it's bad news for them, particularly in the Department of Energy in the United States, but nevertheless, the evidence is there. There is one other thing, and that is that the United States Environmental Protection Agency is consulting on proposals to relax the limits for radiation doses from U.S. nuclear power stations. Well, this study flies right in the face of that. It says, if anything, it should be the other way around. It should be tightening, not relaxing radiation limits near U.S. reactors. So there's two things going on in the United States right now. Both of them are addressed by my article, and it's difficult for me to predict what's actually going to happen. I have a number of friends in the United States, um, quite a few in fact, and they have said to me that they are surprised and amazed at the findings in my study. They say that it has clear implications for what's going on in the United States. So my reaction would be, while the jury's still out, watch this space. Let's see what happens. To what extent do you think it would be possible for the U.S. to put together a study this massive and somehow come up with different results than what you came up with in examining 60 other studies? Well, the first thing is that if they do what we did, in other words, we restricted this to children under five, and also the exposure area to less than five kilometers, i.e. under three miles, it would be extremely surprising if they found out found anything different than we found. The reactors that we're talking about are the similar reactors to the United States, the uh, pressurized water reactors and boiling water reactors. So it would be very difficult. One of the key things I'd like to mention to your uh, listeners is this. Up until 2012, we didn't really know what happened with emissions from nuclear reactors. The only data that we had was annual data. In other words, so many becquerels or petabecquerels or gigabecquerels per annum from a reactor. We didn't really know the time pattern. Now we do. Now we know that the large majority, say two-thirds, three-quarters, of the annual emissions from a reactor occur just once, during one spike. And that spike occurs when the reactor is opened up to take out the old fuel and to put in fresh fuel. And during that time period, about a day, day and a half, the reactors are depressurized. In other words, the huge pressures inside the reactor are, well, we open up the valves and the radioactive gases shoot out. It's during that time that we think that the people downwind are exposed to high levels of radioactivity, i.e. high radiation doses. And that a phenomenon, in other words, that time signature of instead of having even little bits of uh, emissions throughout the 365 days, now you don't have that. You have one big massive spike, which happens over about a day and a half period. And that happens, roughly speaking, about once a year when the fuel rounds are taken out, the old ones, and uh, the new ones are put in. So that's important, very, very important, because it results in doses which are at least 20 times higher 
and maybe even as much as a hundred times higher. I discuss this in my article. So that that's a major worry, and that's that's something that's going to have to be addressed by both the US EPA and also the National Research Council in its future studies. They're going to have to address this big spike in emissions each year from every reactor. That's stunning because, of course, by averaging out over a year, it seems yes. like it would be a much lower thing. Dose. You wouldn't have to worry about it. It wouldn't be a dose that would be damaging, low level, blah, blah, blah. But what you're saying is that the majority of that happens at a predictable time when the fuel rods are being switched out and there is no notice, no awareness, no Correct. sirens going off, no protection, no Correct. awareness. Correct. Indeed, I've said to a number of nuclear operators, look, why don't you do this at nighttime when people are in bed? Mm-hmm. Why don't you do it when it's really, really windy out uh, and it's not raining? And the rain brings the radio clouds back to earth. When, when it's windy, you get massive dispersion. But if it's very calm, then it just drifts everywhere, and you get big doses. No response. Libby, there's one other thing I'd like, a little story I'd like to tell you, which might interest your readers. This time pattern, these spikes, have been hidden from us ever since the beginning of the nuclear power program back in the 1980s. 50s, or late 50s, early 60s. Nobody knew about them, apart from the people who worked in the nuclear industry, and they kept really quiet about it. What happened was that some German scientists who were anti-nuclear began to suspect that there was something funny going on here. So, back in 2012, when the regional government of Baden-Württemberg became red-green, by red-green I mean it was governed by a coalition of socialist and green parties, rather than the, how shall I say, the, the Christian Democrats who are sort of more conservative in their views. The first thing they did was this, this German red-green coalition, um, was that they demanded their nuclear regulator give them data, give the minister, the, the energy minister, data on the half-hourly emissions from the nuclear power plants in their area in Baden-Württemberg. This is intriguing. The energy minister was a woman. I'm afraid I've forgotten her name. And I haven't got it written down, but she was a very powerful and determined lady. And the head of the region's uh, nuclear regulatory commission refused to give the information and said, no, we don't have it. But from the insider, we knew that they did have it. And so the German energy minister said, you will put this data on my desk on Monday morning or you will be fired. And he said, I don't believe you. And she said, right, I want on my desk on Friday afternoon your resignation letter undated. And he had to bring his letter, resignation letter, undated, and she put it in the drawer and said, right, if I don't get this information on Monday morning, I am putting a date on this letter. That's what she did. In other words, she was playing hardball. Um, we got the data, but the trouble is that the data was presented in a computer program form, format that we, nobody had apart from the nuclear industry. So we demanded um, the data in a sort of user-friendly form, and they said, no, you asked for the data, you've got it. We're not helping you anymore. And she was about to sack the regulator when some people in the Green Party who were computer wizards said, look, we can put this, this data into a computer program, shall we call it A, and then transfer that to a computer program B, and then transfer it to Microsoft Excel. And once we get it into Excel, we can read off the data. It took them about three days to do it, but they got it. <laughs> I love it. And then we got the data, and for the first time we saw what was happening. A massive spike, a thousand times higher in terms of concentration than the normal amount. In other words, instead of three becquerels per cubic meter, we're finding 3,000 becquerels per cubic meter. 
In other words, the size of bold increase. And then we knew what was going on. And then we knew, because they had tried, they had hit this since the start of the nuclear power program. When was that? 50 years ago. They've hidden this. And it went to great lengths to prevent us from getting the information. And now we've got it. Now, what I'd like to say to your American listeners is this is very important. You have to go to your regulators and say, there's no reason why this is not occurring also in UK and US reactors. These data are from pressurized water reactors, like in Drimmigen, in uh, Baden-Württemberg, in Germany. And so we know that it's very, very likely the same is happening with US reactors. So what are you going to do about it? That's the wake-up call that I'd like to issue to your uh, listeners, and I hope that uh, at least some of you, some of your listeners, will pick this up and say, whoa, we've got to do something here. It's a powerful piece of information. And Mm. the fact that they knew, that the industry knew about these spikes and went to such great lengths to hide it, means that they understood exactly how devastating that information would be to yes. their business and their financial futures. So, of course, they would do everything in their power to hide it. And good for those people in Germany and that environmental minister and you for getting this information, putting it in a usable form so that we have the opportunity to now use this as a very important piece of weaponry, as it were, on behalf of getting these things shut down and taken care of. So if someone hears this interview or reads your article and realizes that they are living in proximity to a nuclear reactor and they either have or they want to have children, what would you recommend that they do? I've already done this in Canada, in fact, where they've got uh, nuclear reactors, you wouldn't believe, in uh, metropolitan Toronto. It's absolutely crazy. I'm Canadian, so I don't have any joy in saying what I say, but the Ontario government really has got to get a grip of this. And I have said in guidance to Greenpeace Canada that women of childbearing age who wish uh, or intend to have families or even if they've got young ones, or if they're already pregnant, they shouldn't live within 10 kilometers of a reactor. And that people who already live near nuclear reactors and have gardens, they shouldn't eat their own produce if they live within 5 kilometers. And I've actually given that evidence, and it's published on my website in Evidence to Greenpeace Canada. So my advice to is, would be to young women who are living in the shadow of nuclear reactors is don't do it. Ian, if people wish to download a complete copy of your article, how could they do that? Difficult. It's behind a very stiff paywall. Um, my guidance to people who need a full copy for research purposes, would be to contact me. And um, it's permissible under the copyright laws to send individual copies to scientific researchers. You can do that. What is not permissible is for somebody to get a copy, then immediately uh, send it around to hundreds of other people. That is not allowed, I'm afraid, under our present copyright arrangements. Um, For those people who are not, scientific researchers, my guidance to them would be, do they know anybody who works as a scientist in an academic institution, a university in the United States, or do they live near a big national library, either in Washington, D.C., or New York, or L.A., or near the Lawrence Livermore Laboratories, or the Berkeley Laboratories, or any of the National Research Institutes? Because they will have copies of these journals, and they will have a copy of the Journal of Environmental Radioactivity online. Uh, So if they have any friends in universities at all, they will be able to to get them, ask them to download it for them. It's not ideal, 
the present paywall arrangements are unfortunate. Um, that is how the large publishing companies make their living. So that's my best guidance. Ian, anything you would like to add at this point that we haven't covered? I haven't mentioned the name of the organization in Germany which got the data of the emission spikes. It's called IPPNW, and that stands for International Physicians for the Prevention of Nuclear War, IPPNW. They're a, a, a large international organization based, their headquarters are in Boston, in, in Massachusetts. They're a good organization. My hats go off to IPPNW because they were the people that got the data. And IPPNW also provided me with Dr. Alex Rosen, who yes. in Nuclear Hot Seat number 161, I had the opportunity yes. to interview him about the UNSCIR report, which yes. he took apart point by point. It has gone viral. It has been picked up by e, &E News and elsewhere and has become one of the most important interviews that I have done. This one ranks up there as well because right. what you're providing us is with the hardcore scientific evidence that we can use to say we're not a bunch of emotional tree-hugging environmentalists. <laughs> Though we may be in our spare time, but we also have the data to back up what it Absolutely. is that we are saying. My okay. study provides a lot of ammunition. It really does. And try and get a hold of it. And uh, if there are people who desperately who really do need to have this, for example, they have children who live very close to a nuclear reactor, I will send them the, the article, I will, so that they can use it to obtain some sort of redress. I have given evidence in Canada to various public hearings, uh, governmental inquiries and stuff like that. And I'm quite prepared to do that in the United States. Now, here I am, ready, willing and able to help out in any way that I can for the forthcoming, there's two struggles now. One is the National Research Council study and secondly is the US EPA proposals to weaken uh, the safety limits. Ian, thank you so much for sharing your time and your expertise with the listeners of Nuclear Hot Seat. Thank you, Libby. Uh, it's a pleasure from mine, and uh, best wishes to all the uh, campaigners uh, who are opposing the nuclear juggernaut, as you say, in, in the United States. And I'd like to say to you, too, uh, well done, and uh, I hope that uh, we can certainly keep in touch. Dr. Ian Fairley. You can find a link to his article on his study on childhood leukemia rates in proximity to nuclear reactors on the website nuclearhotseat.com slash blog under this episode number 198. You can also follow him on his blog ianfairley.org, click on the news and comments tab. And Dr. Fairley will be one of the speakers at next week's World Nuclear Symposium in Quebec City which is where I'm going to be, to cover all of the events, not only at the symposium, but at the Uranium Film Festival, which is taking place at the same time. All of this for Nuclear Hot Seat listeners. I look forward to bringing you news from filmmakers, activists, and scientists from around the world, along with delicious activist gossip, evidence of our linking up together, and the energy the excitement of the event. As many of our top people from around the world meet, exchange information, and take a giant step forward in turning this nuclear juggernaut around. Thanks to donations and a matching grant, I have been able to book my plane ticket, and the matching grant continues to be available to match you dollar for dollar for any donations. I really appreciate the support I've received so far. And my deepest thanks to those of you from Nuclear Hot Seat who have donated enough to get me up there. However, I still need to raise about $600 to make this thing work. I'm going to have to pay half of my housing in a hotel and all of my meals, plus ground transportation and a lot of little bits and pieces of extras. So I still need your help. If you want to help support me as I give you the best possible coverage of these two events, Help me get there and not be homeless or starving when I am by donating any amount. It's really easy. 
go to NuclearHotSeat.com, scroll down on the home page, and click on the big red donate button. So if you like this show, you like my work, and you're moved to support it as I get you up close and personal with the best, freshest anti-nuclear news possible, please go to NuclearHotSeat.com, big red donate button, do what you can, and know that you really do have my gratitude. Trevor Noah, boy, that just doesn't have the same ring as John Stewart. However, Trevor, you are the upcoming host of The Daily Show. So what can I do to convince you that nuclear issues need to be covered? Okay, South Africa has only two nuclear reactors, so it's probably not that big a deal to you, but it is to us who are in the nuked-up northern hemisphere. Trevor, you need a nuclear pundit. That would be me. Did you get my info packet? If not, I'll resend it, both a hard copy and online. Get yourself up to speed on nukes, Trevor, and then you'll understand why we have to make nuclear numbnuts a regular feature of your show. How about once a month? More frequent? Let's talk. No, wait, that's John. Let's converse. Activist shout out. This week, a reminder that time is running out to let Senator Ron Wyden and President Obama know that we do not want the Trans-Pacific Partnership, or TPP, to gain approval to be fast-tracked. Here is Kimberly Roberson, founder of Fukushima Fallout Awareness Network, to again remind you why this is important to all of us who are concerned about possible radiation contamination in our food. Remember to get out something to write with, because at the end, I'm going to give you the two phone numbers referenced by Kimberly. The Trans-Pacific Partnership, otherwise known as TPP, is a classified secret trade agreement that could allow more radioactive food from Japan to enter the U.S. Senator Ron Wyden of Oregon will decide whether to fast-track the TPP, and his decision will happen possibly in mid-April. President Obama has been pressuring Wyden to OK Fast Track, so he needs to hear from us about Fukushima and the FDA's abysmal policy of fostering the highest allowable levels of radiation in food in the world here in the United States, 12 times higher than Japan, which means that food from Japan deemed unfit for consumption there can legally be sold to U.S. consumers. Men, women, pregnant women, children, infants, the elderly are all susceptible and at risk. FAN is rallying people around the U.S. to call Senator Wyden's offices and President Obama to demand the end once and for all of Fast Track. The final day of this action is April 10th, which is also Becquerel Awareness Day. On April 11th, FAN will host a teleconference event as part of our continuing education series on Fukushima's radioactive impact on the U.S. food supply. A speaker will be on hand to give an update on the TPP fast track process. Defeat of fast track essentially means a defeat of the TPP. So please mark your calendars for these events. More information at www.ffan.us. That was Kimberly Roberson of the Fukushima Fallout Awareness Network. Here are the phone numbers you need to call. Senator Wyden is at 202. 224-5244, and President Obama can be reached at 202-456-1111. For the reasons Kimberly enumerated, do it now. And thanks. And one more shout-out. Next week when I'm up in Quebec, I'm really looking forward to meeting so many of the activists I know through Facebook, through interviews I've done with them, but whom I have never met in person, including Susan Gay Nene, Candace Paul, Angela Bishop, and other activists whose paths I've crossed in the four years since Fukushima began, and especially since I started producing Nuclear Hot Seat. So here's a thought. Let's all bring anti-nuclear T-shirts from our local issues to exchange. I know I've got some that would look great on activists from other parts of the world. 
Let's show how we are linking by proudly wearing each other's campaigns. Personally, I think my San Onofre t-shirt would look great in Saskatchewan and coalition against nukes in, well, Mongolia, Brazil. Let's see what we can do and have some fun with it. Here's today's final thought. In case you haven't guessed, it takes a lot to pull off nuclear hot seat every week, especially organizing the interviews. I regularly reach out to a lot of activists, as well as genuine experts who see things from our perspective. At any given time, I can have at least five to ten or more interview requests out circulating in the world. And I've been known to jump off a juicy email and reach out to whoever sent it to ask them to talk to me on the record. Sometimes I get an immediate response and we decide to either book it or even do the recording right then. At other times, I may get multiple responses to pending requests all at once. Or nobody gets back to me at all. Or whatever's in the queue is on a subject I don't have the heart to approach at that time. Some Tuesdays come when, to be honest, I just can't deal with it. I'm looking forward to stockpiling a whole bunch of interviews at next week's events in Quebec, using them as fallbacks for weeks when I fall into a slump or just need to take some time off. And if I've asked you for an interview and haven't gotten back to you, don't take it personally. Overload, absent-mindedness, existential grief, or, in the best of times, paying client work for my writing business have interrupted the flow. But don't worry. I'll get to as many of you as I can. There is time. After all, it's not like the nuclear issue is going away anytime soon. <sighs> this has been Nuclear Hot Seat for Tuesday, April 7, 2015. Material for this week's show has been researched and compiled from enenews.com, ctvnews.ca, Fairwinds Energy Education, The Statesman Journal, Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution, Potsmere.com, tech.slash.org, KOB TV4, Albuquerque, Jun Albuquerque Journal, NHK, TEPCO, The Times of London, Reuters, Asahi.com, FCCJ, NHK World, Japan Times, The Guardian, RT.com.uk, TechDirt.com, the empathy lacking lackeys at World Nuclear News, and all the strong, attractive, above average folk in the Nuclear Hot Seat Facebook community, which you are all invited to join. Theme music written by me, sung by Marilee Weaver. Looks like Weber, sounds like Weaver. Nuclear Hot Seat is syndicated by UCY.tv and is also available on airprogressive.com. Our archive is available on iTunes. You can subscribe under podcasts, or just check us out on the website, nuclearhotseat.com. That black column on one side has got the last 25 episodes all up, so you just have to click on it. And, of course, our YouTube channel, Nuclear Hot Seat Videos, also carries each week's show. Nuclear Hot Seat is the activist voice on nuclear issues, so if you have a story lead, a hot tip, or a suggestion of someone to interview, send an email to info at nuclearhotseat.com. We are copyright 2015, Lee B. Halevi and Hardest Street Communications. All rights reserved, but fair use allowed as long as proper attribution is provided. This is Lee B. Halevi of Hardest Street Communications, the heart of the art of communicating, reminding you that we've all had our nuclear wake-up call. Now don't go back to sleep because we are all in the nuclear hot seat. Nuclear hot seat, what are those people thinking? Nuclear hot seat, what have those boys been drinking? Nuclear hot seat, the corium is sinking. Our time to act is shrinking, but our activists are linking. Nuclear hot seat, it's the bomb.